Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to DNews Plus again today for episode 2 of 5 in our series on monsters. So far we talked about where monsters came from, you know, their origination. Today we're going to talk about nature and how nature creates some of these monsters too. We called Santa Claus a monster yesterday. If you didn't check out that episode, make sure you go back and check that out before you come to this. And then later in this series, stick around because we're going to talk about monsters and history and culture and even what monsters are going to be in the future. It's going to be really awesome. So in the last episode we talked about what monsters are, you know, where they came from and and how we started to think about them as real things. They were fictional or mythical monsters, but we did touch on one type of monster that is not fictional, it's not mythical. It's a large animal, right? Or a mean animal, then we would call that a monster. Things like dinosaurs and bears and sharks and, you know, I don't know, lions. Anyway, sometimes these are just regular large apex predators or predators at the top of the food chain. And then sometimes they're animals with birth defects, animals that you wouldn't think of as a monster if it hadn't had some kind of mutation. How exactly does nature create monsters? You're probably wondering. Well, everything on earth evolves because of its environment. They are products of their environment. And that creates all sorts of different types of creatures. It's part of the reason we have such a variety of life on our planet. Dinosaurs would grow as big as they are, which is part of the reason why we would call them monsters, because the world that they lived in was different than the world that we live in. Many scientists think that when the dinosaurs were evolving, the atmosphere on Earth was actually more carbon dioxide heavy, and thus it was thicker. Three to five times more carbon dioxide existed than, than today, some scientists think. Thus, the world would have been hotter, more hospitable for cold-blooded animals, and they could use that energy to grow bigger. And possibly that would mean there was more food around too, because carbon dioxide is eaten up by plants. More plants mean bigger herbivores. Bigger herbivores, that means more food for carnivores, which means the carnivores can also get bigger, which brings up another point about monsters. Most monsters are actually just predators. The predator-prey relationship is a huge part of nature. You don't see a lot of monsters that are prey animals, right? That's just not how it is. There aren't zebra monsters, you know? There aren't gazelle monsters. That just doesn't happen. There aren't, you know, I don't know. I guess there are fly monsters if you're a frog, though. Probably not. Anyway, the point is large predators tend to be considered monsters. Because their prey gets bigger, they have to get bigger. Predator and prey is a relationship that exists throughout nature, like I just said, so they have to evolve together. As the herbivores get larger, the predators that prey on those herbivores have to also get larger to be able to take down their prey. That means predators are getting faster and stronger, more poisonous potentially, or can develop stronger bites or can squeeze you or, you know, have better sight or smell or hearing or some kind of other sense. Think of it that way. So we call these things monsters, but from the perspective of nature, they are simply a product of their environment. Another way animals have become monsters as a product of their environment is island gigantism. You may have heard of this, you know, birds that grew to twice the size of humans or lemurs the size of gorillas and gigantic rats and lizards and not just in New York. Uh, this usually comes down to island gigantism. When animals are preyed upon in high numbers, the animals that succeed, the ones that don't get preyed upon, tend to be smaller, quicker, easier to hide from predators. Animals that are larger as prey animals in certain environments tend to get eaten more easily. Without predators, however, which happens a lot on islands, animals grow bigger. There are a lot of different factors involved, you know, timing, location, and food sources, etc. And with island gigantism, there is also island dwarfism, but you could argue that island dwarfism could make monsters as well because some animals could have been larger and now they are smaller and we would consider them a monster. So depending on the animal. For example, the Komodo dragon, super big, right? But its ancestors might have been bigger. Weird, right? Sounds like a monster to me. We all know that just because an animal is an apex predator, an alpha predator, that doesn't mean it's a monster. However, there are times where specific animals from a human perspective did become monsters. And usually we assign those monster characteristics to animals that are bigger, though not always apex predators. Animals that do things that we do, we often consider monsters. 
Wild animals will sometimes terrorize communities. Animals don't usually kill for fun. You know, they don't kill things for no reason. Humans do that sometimes, but animals don't. They kill for a purpose, usually for food or for territory or to protect their young, something like that. But sometimes there are exceptions to that, and these are where monster legends come in. In the 1940s, a rogue elephant went on a killing spree, and thus it was dubbed this monster elephant. But of course, after it was killed, an autopsy found a bullet lodged in its tusk. And the bullet was disrupting the elephant's nerves, which could have led to its aggression. So maybe it wasn't a monster. There are always reasons. Diseases like rabies can affect the brain, leading to over-aggressive animals. And actually, an increase in attacks has been caused because of positive conservation results. Essentially, with more humans around and more animals that have been saved, I'm putting it in finger quotes, saved, that means there are more animal-human interactions. The more animal-human interactions there seems to be, the more monsters we have. The more times that elephants do this thing or lions or bears interact with humans and they become this monster attack bear. But it's really our fault because we showed up in their territory or we showed up near their young, or we showed up and took away their food sources. It's kind of our fault, actually. So nature can make some animals monsters from our perspective. You know, they're big and they're fierce and they're predators, and we think some of them are cute and they eat the cute ones, and then we get mad and we're like, that's a monster. But in reality, a lot of monster talk comes from things that are unknown, right? The origin of that monster might just be something we don't understand. Science comes around, we study it, and suddenly it's not a monster anymore. For example, there were rumors in the jungle of a giant, hollow-eyed, hairy man. It was a monster. It killed men. It beat elephants to death. It was so strong that ten men couldn't capture this hollow-eyed, hairy monster man. A lot of people didn't believe this uh, monster man existed. Turns out, once we started exploring and got some scientists out in the field, it was a gorilla. It's what we call a gorilla now. The narwhal and the Indian rhino both helped lead to the myth of the unicorn, which isn't a monster truly, but is a mythical being, if you will, a mythical animal. Early European explorers visiting Australia found a two-headed creature that hopped around like a frog. It's a kangaroo. If you Google a picture of an oarfish, Kind of looks like a giant sea monster. Go Google it, it's crazy. Even monstrous krakens turned out to be real. Now we just call it a giant squid. There is a theory that I found really interesting while we were researching this from anthropologist David E. Jones. And he says that the dragon, as a mythological creature, a monster, actually grew right out of our brains. It was left over from when we were tree apes. Now bear with me, this is kind of a weird story. The three most vicious predators were the leopard, the python, and the eagle when we were living in the trees as apes. And the apes had a call when one of those animals was near, but they lumped those calls together. It was any one of those three, they had this danger call. Once we left the trees, our brains still had this memory, if you will, a genetic memory of this. And what Jones calls the brain dragon came with us. Our brains were too small to separate out those memories and we birthed the dragon from our own imagination. That's evolutionary psychology. It's super weird. I don't know how I feel about it, but it is interesting to think about. As far as where monsters come from, though, at least in nature, we make that up. It's about how we look at nature, not how nature looks at each other. Yes, to a gazelle, a lion might be a monster, you know? To a seal, a shark might be a monster. Mother Nature is really good at creating scary animals, or animals that we perceive as scary. And our job is then to use our imaginations and exaggerate them or combine them with other animals, or make up stories about what we think they do or what we think they eat or where they come from. We talked earlier about the griffin coming from dinosaur bones and people thinking about giant lizard skulls, so there must have been these monsters roaming the earth, and they'll start telling stories to each other. Humans and animals have existed together for a long time. We are animals. And along the way, we've had interactions with animals that we would call them monsters. But they have been exaggerated over time. So now, we create monsters in things like King Kong, giant gorilla. Godzilla, giant lizard thing. The list goes on and on. We've created all of these monsters. Humans make them. 
And sometimes animals make that process easier, but for the most part, they're pretty much just from our imaginations. But we're gonna talk more about imaginary monsters tomorrow, because today there are certain monsters that just seem to stick around like zombies and Wolfman and stuff. It's gonna be really cool. So make sure you subscribe so you get all of the episodes this week about monsters. And if you're interested in watching more about monsters, check out Monster Week on Animal Planet. Tune in at nine, eight central on Thursday. Thanks for tuning in to D News Plus today, everybody. I'm Trace, come find me on Twitter at Trace Dominguez, and we'll see you next time.